Buffalo Bills stampeded the Raiders with a no-huddle offense that produced seven touchdowns and 51 points. The New York Giants dethroned the two-time defending champion 49ers with punishing defense and without scoring a touchdown. Stay tuned for our special Super Bowl preview of the Bills-Giants matchup from Tampa, inside the NFL. I'm Brian Burwell. In this week's cover story, we'll explore the impact of staging the Super Bowl with a short work week and on the cloud of war. I'm Ray Nitschke. As a Green Bay Packer, we won five world championships and two Super Bowls. Stay tuned and see what I'm doing now. Joining us to analyze Super Bowl 25 will be Dolphins coach Don Shula, along with all pros Warren Moon and Joey Browner. And now, from Tampa, site of Super Bowl 25, inside the NFL, professional football's most informative hour, with Len Dawson, Nick Bonacati, and Chris Collinsworth. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Harbor Island in Tampa, Florida. This is our Super Bowl preview program. But Nick and Chris, before we talk about this year's matchup between the Bills and the Giants, I want your thoughts on last week's championship game, starting with that blowout between the Bills and Raiders. Lay the Bills look like they had the Raider playbook. The Raiders, after the first quarter, they went through a state of shock, and they just never recovered. Nick, I don't know if you've noticed, but the Bills' offense almost looks like a replica of the Cincinnati Bengals now. Back in 1988, when we beat the Bills in the AFC Championship game, Marv Levy and the Bills adopted Sam White's running game. And now with the no-huddle offense, I feel like I'm watching my old teammates play out there. Well, I wish other teams would follow suit because the thing I really enjoyed watching was the quarterback. Jim Kelly calling the plays and not somebody from the sidelines. But that was a blowout. The other game, the 49er Giant contest, was a different affair. Lenny, a typical knock the hell out of them type of football game. Absolutely great. But it was a backup quarterback's courage that gave the Giants the opportunity to win in the last two minutes. You know, the two best football games I saw all year were both the Giant 49ers games. But my only question is, can the Giants bounce back in just one week after that street fight in San Francisco? Well, Chris, that's a very good question. Let's talk about this year's Super Bowl matchup. And for the first time in four years, the AFC is the favorite going in. Letting Marv Levy's toughest job is to get the Bills players' heads out of the clouds and back to earth. The Giants, on the other hand, they're disciplined, and they have the mental toughness to do to the Bills what they did to the 49ers. That is to shut them down. But can the Giants throw the ball well enough to be world champions? That's the only weakness I can find with that Giants team. But as far as the Bills are concerned, there are no holes. You know, the Giant defense, you don't worry about them. They shut the 49ers, Rice and Montana down, not once, but twice. But we're going to talk about this matchup in detail later on in the program. Right now, let's find out how they got to Tampa. Against a backdrop of a world at war, the Giants and 49ers provided a needed diversion. A game full of intrigue and suspense and whose outcome was in doubt until the dramatic final kick. Not too guys from Jersey, we have we drink beer out of cans, you know, and it's Budweiser, and we don't have cheerleaders, and we don't have fancy stuff. We just know how to go down and make guys like Joe Montana feel sick. For the football faithful of Northern California, it is wine that gets the juices flowing for the annual NFC Championship party. Revelers may have expected a whole hum affair with Jeff Hostetler helming the Giants' attack, but this would be a lively party. As 
the game evolved into a battle between the NFC's number one and two ranked defenses, every scoring opportunity became critically important, particularly the ones that were missed. Picks to make it going right. He's going to throw. Maurice Carthon's drop forced the Giants to settle for three points as the teams bided time with field goals while looking for the chance to break the game open. All right, that's where the jam on that too, okay? Hey, um, Keep hammering them. Keep hammering those outside the team. They stayed middle, and then they brought the weak side safety up in the right. cover of the run. Right. And, 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 and he might have been the bump on you, but there was, there was no safety over the top of him. It would be Joe Montana who would provide the game's first decisive moment by threading the needle to John Taylor, deep in the Giants zone. Montana throws down the left sideline. It is good! touchdown woke up the candlestick park crowd and the 49ers responded by going for the jugular by way of an assault on the passing pocket and the Giants Hostetler. Hostetler is down. Boy, He's hurt. Really gave him a shot. He's hurt. But instead of cowering, the Giants answered by attacking. Is it in the playbook to try a fake when you're fighting for a chance to go to the Super Bowl? Ooh, a fake. It's going to be a fake. They run across the 50, 45, 40, 35, 30. Linebacker Gary Reason's 30-yard run off a fake punt, which he had called at the line of scrimmage, set up a field goal that got the Giants to within one point before the 49ers were dealt the most severe blow they could have imagined. Courtesy of Giants defensive end Leonard Marshall, number 70. Plenty of time, rolls away, now runs away. Montana was clobbered. Leonard Marshall caught him with his helmet right in the middle of the back, upper part of the back. You know, a good, legit hit. And this was a big hit, Joe. This was as, as good a hit as Montana has taken all year. As big a hit. As Steve Young took control of the 49ers huddle, the light behind the 49ers aura of playoff invincibility sad days. Helpless to watch as Giants Eric Howard and Lawrence Taylor teamed up to produce the play which ended any hopes of three-peating. Again to Roger, and he hits a wall, loses the ball, Giants have it. The Giants have a shot now, they get it at the 43-yard line, and New York suddenly handed an opportunity. All right, baby, all right, baby. We're a minute away from Tampa Bay, baby. A minute away, now. A minute away, baby. Giants are trailing by a point. All depends on Matt Barr. Fans are on their feet and screaming. Snap, spot, kick is away, it's got the distance. It is good. And the Good. Giants are going to set, going to Tampa Bay. It's over for the three peats. It's over.
1951, baseball's New York Giants went to the World Series on Bobby Thompson's shot heard around the world. Forty years later, football's New York Giants now go to the Super Bowl in similar fashion. To help us shed some insight into the Giants-Bills matchup is all-pro safety of the Minnesota Vikings, Joey Browner. Joey joins Nick on NFL Crosstalk. Gentlemen. Joey, you played the Giants this year, and the Giants did beat you. But I, you played there with Phil Simms, that quarterback. Jeff Hosteller is there now. Is this a better football team with Hosteller? I believe so because he uh, has an added dimension where he can run the ball and scramble it when, they, when the defensive line gets through and uh, he feels he's in trouble. He's able to pull it down. He's a headsy ball player. He will not throw the ball in the coverage. Uh, he'll run the ball and, and get a few yards before he do anything silly with the ball. You're the Giants on defense, and now the Bills come out with a no-huddle offense. How do you defense that? Well, what we did, uh, we played against a similar team that runs that run-and-shoot offense. We, uh, we kept our nickel package in the whole game and uh, made them figure out what we were doing. And so the only way to stop the... Uh, to stop that no huddle offense is to get in there, make some things happen, and, and, uh, and get them to start thinking. If you're the Bills and you got that great giant defensive front four and Lawrence Taylor and Leonard Marshall coming up after you, how do you probe them? If you're on offense, how are you going to probe the giant defense? Well, you don't. You just find out where they are. Uh, you put some guys on them and just keep them, keep them at bay, and then you run plays at them. I think if you run plays at them, that'll keep them more heads up. They'll, they'll worry about the run blocking, and, and when it's time that they think it's gonna, they're gonna, you're going to run, then they'll, you'll pass it. And so that makes it where it'll, it'll be a little more off balance for them and they have to think a little bit more. Andre Reed, James Lofton, the Raiders can't slow them down, the Dolphins didn't slow them down. The Giants have a great defense. How are they going to slow them down? Well, it's hard to say when you got four uh, wide receivers in, in, in the pass pattern because you can find any of them. In, Lately, they've been finding Lofton. He's been wide open. He's made some great plays. And Andre Reed, he just runs across the middle and then catches it. And when he catches it, he has that burst to where he can get that extra yardage. So it's kind of hard to just zero in on those two because in the game, as you saw uh, just this past weekend, they were using uh, guys that you never even heard of before, and they're catching the ball and making big plays. And so uh, it's kind of hard to say who exactly to defend on. But I would defend the, 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 the old crafty guy, Lofton. Joey, I put you on the spot. Who's going to win and why? Well, I feel that the Giants will win because of their defensive uh, play lately. Uh, if you can go in and shut the 49ers down in their backyard to where they only can kick field goals, uh, you got a big plus. Joey, thank you for being on the show. We appreciate it. Well, thanks, Nick. Back to you, Lenny and Chris. All right, Nick, thank you very much. Chris, when you were with Cincinnati, you used the no-huddle offense. The Bills are going to throw that against the Giants this week. Now, the Giants are going to have problems getting substitutions in on defense. What other problems are going to present it to that Giant defense? Well, Lenny, one thing that I haven't heard anybody talk about is the conditioning factor for the New York Giants defensive line. We found in Cincinnati that after three or four straight plays in the no-huddle offense, the conditioning really became a factor, especially for those big guys up front. So look in the third and fourth quarter for the defensive line of the Giants to begin to wear out a little bit. Especially down here in Tampa where it's going to be hot on Sunday. With the Raiders twice defeating Cincinnati's no huddle offense, surely Buffalo's offensive fireworks could be shut down just as easily. The Raiders were a supremely confident team 60 minutes away from their fifth Super Bowl. But as the folks in Buffalo know, in a New York minute, everything can change. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Van Miller in Orchard Park, New York, and the road to the Super Bowl goes through Rich Stadium. It is the Bills and the Raiders looking to trade the cold and the snow of western New York for a trip to the balmy breezes of Florida and the Super Bowl in Tampa. The target may be Tampa, but for many fans, the focus was elsewhere. is mere diversion, but this season no team is a more entertaining diversion than the enthusiastic Bills.
Right from the first snap, Jim Kelly rocked the Raiders with a hurry-up, no-huddle offense. The Bills' version of the run-and-shoot. He looks, he looks, he rolls right. He can go it himself. Touchdown, Andre Reid! Wide open in the end zone. We've got a late flag on the play. Even a negated touchdown and a bad snap on the next play couldn't stop the league's highest scoring attack from cashing in. Rolls to the right, still on his feet. Now throws, it's good to Lawson. He runs in for the score. Dave Lawson, what a play. Let's go, Jay! Breathe home, baby, breathe home! By land or air, there was no stopping the Buffalo Bills. Herman at the 10, breaks the tackle to the 5, he's in for the touchdown. On Thomas's touchdown, number 75, defensive end Howie Long was caught out of position on a stunt. Thomas simply streaked through the vacant landscape, ignored three attempted tackles, and scored. can poo -poo this no huddle off and saying that they've seen it before but they've never seen it the way the Bills run it. For Art Shell and his Raiders, the worst was yet to come. Number 56, Darrell Talley, who many consider to be the Bills' best linebacker, picked off the first of a pair of passes. And despite number 81, Tim Brown's pickpocket attempt, retained both the football and his personal moment of glory. Afternoon, the Bills' defense matched the offense in near perfection, hounding Jay Schrader and completely closing off the end zone to the Raiders. Intercepted in the end zone, under Smith, under the 10, under As a counterpoint, Buffalo's line kept Raider rushers at bay. This allowed the Bills' pair of gifted receivers to roam free to work their magic. On this signature day in Bill's history, the magic also belonged to number 23, Kenneth Davis, who scored three times against the defense that allowed only four rushing touchdowns all season. Unbelievable! It took 25 years to get there, and they did it in championship style, annihilating the Raiders 51-3. to three. The Bills are going to the Super Bowl. To beat a team very badly today, that's a damn good football team. Don't be misled by the size of the score, because you got another river to cross. Oh, hey, 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 hey. Also, it hasn't been our goal. It hasn't been our goal to go to the no. Super Bowl. Right. 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 So win, win, Never that. Ralph Wilson, the owner and founder of the Buffalo Bills since 1960, has waited a long time to see his team in a Super Bowl. Twice they came very close. In 1966, my Chiefs defeated them to go to Super Bowl I. Then in 1988, Chris's Bengals defeated them in the AFC Championship game. This year, the Bills would not be denied. Joining Chris on NFL Crosstalk right now is a man who knows a great deal about the Buffalo Bills, particularly their defense. Houston Oilers quarterback, Warren Moon. Thanks, Lenny. Warren, you guys were one of the few teams that had success this year against the Buffalo Bills. You did manage to beat them down in the Astrodome. Do you think the New York Giants can throw the football well enough to beat them? I think they can if they're willing to do it. It's something the Giants really don't want to do is throw the football, and everyone knows that. They want to run the ball, control the clock, and eat up as much time as possible. And uh, 
I think in order for them to win this football game, they're going to have to throw it a little bit more than usual because Buffalo is going to stack their defense up to try and stop that run. So this is where Jeff Hosteller really becomes important. You know, everybody, it seems, that has had success has had the success throwing the football. But you guys obviously saw some weakness in that Buffalo defense. What was it? Yeah, we wanted to start the game off trying to establish the run, believe it or not. Buffalo plays a lot of zone back there. And uh, we wanted to take advantage of the, the quickness of their two defensive ends, Bruce Smith and Cornelius Bennett. Those guys really like to fly upfield and really get pressure on the quarterback, so we wanted to slow them down early in the ball game with some draw plays and also some screens to try and neutralize their speed and take them out of the game a little bit. Is that the reason that you hear that sometimes people have success running right at Bruce Smith? Both of those guys, Bruce Smith and Cornelius Bennett, are great uh, athletes, and they, they really pursue the ball well when it's away from them. And I think the only way to, to slow down a great athlete like that is to try and run at him. Now, Bruce Smith is a guy that people think you can run at all the time, but he can really take people on, too, more than people think. But I think the best way to take advantage of him is to run at him as much as possible. All right, you're one of the top quarterbacks in the league. Had a great year this year, no matter what I said about you guys in the <laughs> run and shoot down there. Let's talk about the two quarterbacks in this game. Start off with Jeff Hosteller. His mobility, obviously, an added plus for the New York Giants. He really has added a new dimension to the uh, Giants' offense, an offense where I felt was a pretty stagnant offense because of what they try and do. They're not very uh, exciting to watch, but they seem to get the job done. I, I think with his insertion, he's added a new dimension in the fact that he can get outside, he can make things happen. Uh, he'll scramble and get the first downs, and he'll do the little things that it takes to keep that, those chains moving, which is what they want to do. How about Jim Kelly? He had the problem with his knee earlier this year. The Giants are notorious for that pass rush that comes right up the middle. Will he be mobile enough to get away from it? Well, Jim's playing really well right now with a lot of confidence, and their whole offense is playing real well. But I think what the Giants are going to try and do is put a lot of pressure with their front four people up front. And they play a lot of zone back there. They try not to give up the big play, and it, it'll be tough for him. He's going to have to be very patient and take the underneath stuff at first. And uh, they're going to try and put pressure, I'm sure, up the middle to see if he'll step up in the pocket and throw, especially with that bad knee that he has. All right, quickly, who's going to win and why? <laughs> I think this is going to be one of the best Super Bowls in, in the um, most recent years because of the fact that you got a great explosive offensive team against a great defensive football team. And I really think it's going to come down to special teams play. It's going to come down to field position football. I just don't think Buffalo is going to score the amount of points that, that they've scored the last two games. But I do think that the Giants are going to have to score at least 20 points to win the football game. But I have to give the edge to Buffalo right now because they can score points. All right, Warren. Appreciate you being with us. Thank you. All right, back to you, Lena Nick. Chris, thank you very much. Nick, during the regular season, Warren Moon and his team really picked the Bills secondary apart. Do you think the Giants will be able to do that? Bill, you know, as I looked at the Buffalo Bill defense, I thought the weakness was in their secondary. But that's before Mark Kelso came back to play free safety for the Buffalo Bills. Now, he may not be as big and as strong as Ronnie Light is for the 49ers, but I certainly believe that he has the same impact. And since he's come back, that Buffalo Bills defense has really solidified. Well, he's one of the outstanding safeties in the league, that's for sure. When Buffalo and New York opened camp in July, both had questions surrounding their teams, from holdouts and harmony to injuries and schedules. The road to Tampa has not been an easy one. 1990 had a stormy beginning for Giants head coach Bill Parcells. Six defensive holdouts included Lawrence Taylor, who signed just days before the regular season. Nobody gets exactly what they want. It's not like that. Big picture says that, um, my teammates and my coaches and, and a lot of fans deserve to have some good football play, and I plan on playing some good football. Taylor played better than good football from the outset. He's been back inside the five, throws, tipped high, intercepted by Taylor, he'll score! Oh, Lawrence, the magician! Taylor registered an interception and four and a half sacks in his first three games. But on the final play of the Giants' 20-3 win over Miami in week three, Taylor suffered a pulled hamstring. And many wondered why the star linebacker was still on the field with the game already decided. Well, you know, I can't think for everybody around here. So, it's just one of those things. I'm contracted to play football. I'm not contracted to play 20 minutes. 30 minutes, I'm uh, contracted play from the start, uh, the be beginning whistle to the ending whistle. And um, basically, I wanted to be there. I want to be there until the final whistle blows. Taylor may have grabbed the headlines early, but other defenders became the big story the rest of the way. <laughs> Number 
Number 52 inside linebacker Pepper Johnson stepped forward with a Pro Bowl season when outside linebacker Carl Banks missed several games with a thumb injury. And Plan B free agent cornerback Everson Walls led the team with six interceptions as the Giants' defense allowed the fewest points in the NFL. On offense, the steady passing of Phil Simms and the emergence of number 27 rookie running back Rodney Hampton helped the Giants sprint to a 10-0 mark, the best start in team history. Fans in New York were actually talking about an undefeated season until the Giants came unglued in Philadelphia. reception wasn't any friendlier the following Monday night in San Francisco, where the Giants dropped a 7-3 decision to the 11-1 49ers. Two straight losses and an attack of kidney stones were testing Bill Parcells late in the season, just as Buffalo head coach Marv Levy was tested earlier in the year. Levy's team had developed a reputation in 1989 for bickering and infighting among players and coaches, and that issue resurfaced during a 30-7 loss to Miami in Week 2, when defensive end Bruce Smith confronted Levy about pulling Buffalo starters too early in the game. I didn't blast Marv Levy. I just came out and said, we as a unit gave up. Uh, it was a situation where as uh, a lot of tempers were flaring, and uh, we didn't know how to handle it at that point in time, but uh, I think it worked out for the best for us. Instead of growing apart, the Bills became united with a single purpose, winning. And they followed the loss in Miami with eight straight victories, which included some of the most incredible fourth quarter comebacks of the season. The Bills were never out of a ball game, especially with running back Thurman Thomas, who for the second straight season led the NFL in total yards from scrimmage. And on defense, the Bills featured another of the game's most potent performers. Hammer time. Bruce Smith brought the hammer down on opposing quarterbacks for 19 sacks. And in 1990, many people, including Smith himself, believed he had overtaken Lawrence Taylor as the game's premier defensive player. He has been the dominant player in the NFL, and uh, there's no secret about it. And I think uh, this past year, that with my play, I have taken it up a notch, and, and I feel that right now I am. Um, I'm, I'm not trying to take any credit away from Lawrence or, or any of the other players that uh, possibly deserve it, but uh, I think it's about time to, to give credit to uh, some other people that, that deserve it as well, and I think uh, right now I deserve the credit. Smith's Bills defeated Taylor's Giants 17-13 in Week 15, but by game's end, both teams had suffered a major loss. Sprained the ligament, and uh, we'll see how quickly it quiets down. We'll reassess it and see where the extent of the uh, time that's going to be needed for his uh, recuperation. So he could be back. Oh yes, yes, we anticipate him to come back. While Kelly recovered, backup Frank Reich was called upon to win the Bills' most important game of the season, a Week 16 showdown with the Dolphins for the AFC East title. Reich responded, and Marv Levy's team had shown a championship character that many people didn't believe they possessed. It's a great football team with a lot of moral fiber and a lot of character, and they showed it. And I think those who say that they don't have it, and there are who do and who wait for them to stumble, uh, ought to examine their own character. The Bills have done anything but stumble in the playoffs as Jim Kelly has returned to guide a near unstoppable offense. For the Giants, backup Jeff Hostetler has come through to win all four of his starts, including two postseason victories, to get his team to the game most people thought it could never reach. After some tenuous moments throughout the season, the state of New York's finest have emerged as this season's two true survivors, two teams with their eye on football's ultimate prize in Super Bowl XXV.
28 coaches started the year on the road to Tampa, but only Parcells and Levy remain. One coach who has devised game plans this season for both the Giants and Bills is Don Shula, head coach of the Miami Dolphins. Shula has taken a record six teams to the Super Bowl and now joins his former captain, Nick Bonacani, to analyze Super Bowl Sunday. Don, first, congratulations on having a great year. The first question I want to ask you, though, is uh, regarding the one week off between the championship game and the Super Bowl. Now, does it give the coaches enough time to properly prepare their teams for this important game? I don't think so, Nick. Uh, you need at least uh, two weeks because the game is so important, and you got to take your team away and, and get them prepared the way that they should be prepared. you got to give your injured players a chance to heal up, and I just can't see the one-week thing. I think if there's an emergency situation and you have to have the game within one week, then, you know, play it because it's the same for both teams. But to prepare for a game of this magnitude, to do the best job that you can, you need more than one week. I'll tell you, from a player's point of view, I couldn't agree with you more. Down the Bills offense, now, it almost looks unstoppable. Now, you guys and the Raiders uh, couldn't stop them. If you had to do it again, if it was the third try, what would you do differently to try to contain Buffalo? Well, the thing that killed us in, in the last ball game was the fact that uh, we tried to blitz some and they kill us with a blitz. We had bad matchups. We, we didn't have people that could cover their receivers. So if you can blitz them and you've got some good coverage people, then you've got a chance. But uh, Kelly will burn you there, too. I think you've got to be able to mix it up. You've got to be able to play zone. You've got to be able to play man. You've got to be able to get your nickel uh, defense in there when you have to and, and keep mixing them up so that they don't know uh, who you're going to have in a game, and it's a guessing game for them as well as it is for you. Well, how do you do that, though, Coach, if they, if they don't use, if they use the no huddle and they earn that huddle and they just come out? Uh, how, do you, how do you substitute with the no huddle offense? There are still times where you can get substitutes in, at least one substitute. You can get a nickel back in there and get a linebacker out. Uh, on an incompleted pass or a running play and get your guy in there as soon as you know what the next down and distance is going to be. Uh, you can do maybe one. You can't do wholesale substitutions. So let's look at it from the Giants' point of view. You know, Jim McKelly and Danny Marino, they're very similar in their throwing ability. When you guys played the Giants, they shut Danny down. He only got three points on a board. What did they do to keep you guys off the board, and can they do it to Kelly? Well, they do two things. First of all, on offense, they hold the ball, and uh, if they can run the ball 40 or 50 times a game like Parcells wants to do, then they're going to be keeping the ball away from the Bills' offense. And then defensively, with that soft double zone that they play, they don't give up the cheap touchdown. And their linebackers are such great athletes, and their front three and four when they're sending uh, that linebacker, the extra guy rushing, they put a lot of pressure on you, and their linebackers are big hitters. they got a great defense. You know, let's look at the game. Buffalo coasted against the Raiders. The Giants had a real tough, hard-fought uh, game against the 49ers. Who do you think has a psychological advantage here? I don't think uh, neither team does. I think uh, the Buffalo is so excited about uh, getting into the Super Bowl after, after such a long period of time, and, and they're going to be revved up, and Kelly's at the top of their game. They're a hot team. But the Giants are the type of team that can cool off a hot team, and I, don't, I really don't think either team has an advantage. Quickly, Coach, who do you like and why? <laughs> well, I'm going to pull. Let me say I'm going to pull for the AFC because uh, we got beat by Buffalo, and I want to get beat by the best. But I like George Young. I like the Giants. I think that Parcells does a great job over there. I think that they're, they're the kind of football team that can win the game, but I'm going to pull for the AFC. Well, Coach, again, congratulations on a great year, and uh, best to you and your family. And I'll see you down in Miami. Thank you, Nick. Back to you, Lenny. All right, Nick, thank you very much. The coach perhaps picked the AFC from his heart rather than <laughs> his head, but these two teams met in week 15 and the Bills defeated the Giants. You think the Bills have a psychological edge? Well, ordinarily, I would say yes, just because of the fact that they beat them and beat them on their home field. But after watching the Giants last week and the 49ers beat them earlier this year, I don't think it's going to be much of a factor. I think you're right. You know, you've heard about the hurry-up offense. How about the hurry-up Super Bowl? This year, the conference championships and the Super Sunday are just one week apart. In this week's cover story, Ryan Burwell looks at the ramifications of having no off week. There was a time not long ago when really about the biggest worry for Super Bowl week was whether or not you were going to get enough sun and fun. But this week at Super Bowl 25, things are just a bit different. They're trying to stage this event with one less week to prepare and under the disturbing cloud of the Persian Gulf crisis. Preparation began a month ago, but what color paint would they need on the field? Normally with a two-week window, no problem. 
but last Sunday morning, grounds crews waited with enough paint for four different teams. And later that evening, the mad decorating scramble began. Thursday's rehearsal for halftime programs, Friday's rehearsal for uh, uh, pregame show, Saturday's team's workout, so actually you have to try to get the work done in three days. Now, the threat of war-related terrorism has created extra security burdens. We are not doing daily bomb sweeps, but we will do probably three or four of them before the game. But we're preparing to protect 75,000 people. A lot of out-of-towners, a lot of VIPs, and a lot of the NFL people. We're, we're gearing up to protect them against any probability. Like everywhere else, the pinch of recession is making a dent in the central Florida economy. So the Super Bowl's projected economic impact of $135 million should give Tampa St. Pete a sizable boost. But with one less week of football tourism, will there really be enough time to make all that money? We would like to sell before for a 12-day period. Now we only have these few days left. So in, in terms of profitability, it was reduced. Our records are showing that a number of the press and guests are coming in later this year than they have in prior years. So we don't know if it's entirely because of the one week between games. It may affect us a little bit, but overall I don't think it affects us that much because we're busy at this time of year anyway. Uh, it's cold in the rest of the country and warm here, and I don't think that that uh, one week is going to make that much of a difference. The silliness of two weeks of hype is gone. The 3,000 electronic and print media who've descended on this city have an odd task. The world still wants to know all about this game, but with a slightly more somber attitude. It's a tainted situation, a national emergency, where the Super Bowl becomes secondary to what's going on, and, and there's uncertainty day to day as to what's going to happen. Even the coverage of the game, depending on how the world events unfold, will be heightened because of the uh, suppose maybe terrorist activities and the heightened security. So news as well as sports has to get involved in, in that story. With over 90,000 people and 650 planes converging on Tampa this week, getting here has been a logistical nightmare, especially with only seven days notice. Now add to that the bankruptcy of Eastern Airlines, the mad scramble for media charters, and the hotly debated travel package arranged by the NFL. We tried to tie up uh, two travel companies, two highly respected travel companies, Thomas Cook and Disney Travel, and put together a package that we get hotel rooms and air flights at basically no risk to the fans. So they could turn around and make a reservation January 1st with no money outlay. Uh, you know that if your team made it on Wednesday, you'd go pick up your travel documents, and on Thursday, you'd be on an airplane going to the game. I think it's been misunderstood a little bit what that was all about. And so the game goes on as organizers confidently, quietly hope that when America's grandest party is over, the biggest headlines, the only headlines, are about the action over there at Tampa Stadium. But no matter how this strange week ends, this will be the Super Bowl remembered not as the Super Bowl of the short work week, but as the Super Bowl when our nation went back to war. This is just the third time in the 25 years of Super Bowl competition that the teams do not have a week off after the championship games. I played in two Super Bowls, one with the week off, one without. Personally, I prefer to get on with the competition and try to eliminate some of the Super Bowl media craziness going on down here. Chris, who do you think has the advantage this week? Well, Lenny, I think you're talking about what will be the deciding factor in this football game. The Bills basically had a week off last week against the Raiders. Meanwhile, the Giants were playing the 49ers in what I thought was the hardest hitting football game of the year. I just don't think the Giants can bounce back in just one week from that game. I don't agree with you, Chris. I like the team that has the toughest role to hold. They're tired, they're so sore, they lament, they bitch about the situation, but they're more mentally tough to get back into the trenches and to go after that team and win the football game knowing they can rest on Monday. You know, the Giants do not have to be brought back to reality. They just went through a dogfight with the 49ers, but as far as the Bills are concerned, the last time I saw Cornelius Bennett and Bruce Smith, they were dancing on the sidelines. 
Marvel Eve, he's got to bring them out of that dream world. Now, I mentioned I didn't want a week off. What about you guys? I think God have a week off. Now, we've earned the right to be on America's stage and to let everybody know what our life stories are all about. <laughs> you know, I can remember being bored with your life story back when you were in the Super Bowl, but the thing that I liked the most was the week of partying after you won the AFC Championship game. Those were my best memories of the Super Bowl. Of course, I don't have many good memories You've of the You've been Super partying Bowl. ever since. <laughs> all right, on a more serious note, gentlemen, because of the war in the Persian Gulf, and the worldwide interest in the Super Bowl. More safety measures than ever before will be instituted for this gathering. Lisa Burkhardt reports on the additional security for America's biggest party. The NFL and government officials have done everything to assure that Super Sunday doesn't become Black Sunday, the 1977 movie where terrorism invades the Super Bowl. The participation of the federal agencies uh, is, is greater as since, uh, since the invasion of Kuwait, uh, to be candid with you. Their, their supplying of information, intelligence information, communication uh, capabilities, that's been enhanced uh, considerably. At the stadium, you can see the increase in security in several ways. There's a new cement wall with a chain link fence attached, which prevents cars from breaking through. Every vehicle entering the stadium is being searched, as are the people who enter the field area. Metal detectors are being used for extra measures. Bomb squads have been canvassing the stadium for a week now, and 1,600 law enforcement officials, about double what Super Bowls usually require, will be assigned to the game. The good news is we've had a lot of terrorist threats in the past Super Bowl. We've had problems there, and we've addressed them, and nobody's known that what's gone on. Uh, we have a great working relationship with the FBI, the Tampa Police Department, the Hillsborough Sheriff's Department, and we worked out the details with them to do certain things that will be done differently. Security at traditional terrorist spots, like baggage claim at the airports, will also be tighter. Hotels where the fans and players are staying have extra security also, as Tampa leaves nothing to chance. We've been running everything from fire drills, going through bombed, uh, release programs where we've actually uh, planned that there was a bomb scare in the hotel and taken ourselves to the drills. All the way through, you know, we're hiring practices as carefully as we can. Make no mistake about it, uh, we have the capabilities to deal with any uh, situation and uh, we're prepared to deal with any situation and planned for any situation, so there'll be tight security. From hostage negotiating teams to SWAT teams, Tampa plans to make sure everything goes well as the world watches. I know because of the war in the Middle East, security has to be improved at Super Bowl 25. But God willing, peace will come and we'll never have to go through this once again. Joining me is Gary Myers. Gary has covered, now this is your 10th Super Bowl. On Tuesday, before every Super Bowl, you go to the stadium, get an opportunity to get your stories and interview all the players. Was it a little different this time around? It was a lot different, Lenny. As you saw on that piece on security, there are metal detectors and x-ray machines at the gates at the stadium and usually you just walk right in media day but today it took about 25 minutes to get through the gates because each one of us had to put any cameras or tape recorders through the x-ray machine and then we we're individually checked with the metal detectors you know that brings up another subject the world league of american football is scheduled to start this spring could this war have an effect on that absolutely the teams right now in the world league have been informed that if the middle east crisis has not been resolved by march 1st the teams that are scheduled to play in barcelona Frankfurt and London could possibly be moved and be played in the United States this year for security reasons and also they don't want the teams having to travel to Europe during a time of a crisis. I mentioned earlier in this show that this is the third Super Bowl where you do not have an extra week after the championship games to get ready for uh, the Super Bowl. Now, has this had any effect or concern with any of the coaching staffs? Well, it has an effect on Buffalo. Marv Levy really is making it more of a problem than it is. He didn't want to show up until Wednesday morning here in Tampa when his team was coming on Monday night, and the league forced him to show up with his team Monday night. But then Levy became the first coach in Super Bowl history to not show up at the Tuesday photo session, and he will be substantially fined sometime in the next couple of weeks by Paul Tagliabue. The, the Bills have been causing a lot of problems for themselves. They switched hotels they weren't happy with. The Giants, meanwhile, just showed up straight from San Francisco, got here 2 o'clock Monday morning, and it's business as usual for them. You know, I go back to some of the coaches in the Super Bowl that have created some problems. How have they fared? I remember uh, Bud Grant, for one. 
Well, Bud Grant lost four Super Bowls, and it seemed every time he was in there, he was complaining about locker room facilities or the hotels. George Allen used to complain about the hotels all the time. Dick Vermeil put, you know, curfews on his players uh, in the early 80s, and they lost. So the coaches that treat this business as usual usually win. Now, a couple of coaching jobs still available, one here in Tampa, the other in Cleveland. Have you heard anything about either one of those jobs? Well, right here in Tampa, it seems that Richard Williamson, who was an assistant on the staff, will get the job. There's an outside chance that Hugh Culverhouse is being talked into interviewing Buddy Ryan, but that's just an outside chance. As far as Cleveland is concerned, right now it's two candidates, Mike White, the Raiders quarterback coach, and Bill Belichick, the Giants defensive coordinator. White has the edge right now, but because of the Giants defensive performance in the playoffs so far, Belichick is becoming a hot coach, a glamour name that Art Modell is going to interview next week and might possibly hire. All right, let's talk about this game. Who do you think is going to win? Well, I like the Giants because of the defense. I think they're the only team in the league that can slow down that no huddle offense. They saw it once already this year. I think they know how to make the adjustments. I think they'll win 23-21. All right, Gary, thank you very much. We'll see you next week in New York. Okay, Len. When I played in Super Bowl I, both teams employed the 4-3 defense. Since that time, they're using the 3-4, eliminating the middle linebacker. Great players like Dick Butkus, Willie Lanier, Nick Bonacani, and the subject of this week's Where Are They Now? Ray Nitschke. On the most celebrated avenue in Green Bay, Wisconsin, sits its most famous structure, Lambeau Field, home of the Green Bay Packers. Inside, one of their proud warriors strolls the turf and reminisces of the glory and championships of which he was a part. When I went on the field, I felt I was the best player on the field. And I tried to live up to that. And I tried to uh, play with the emotions and play every down like it was the last down. I, uh, I was obsessed in that I wanted to prove to myself that I could compete with anybody at any level and be the very best I possibly could. Now he presides over his turf at his home in suburban Green Bay, where life is much calmer. Ray's family consists of his three adopted children and his wife, Jackie, whom he regards as the best thing that ever happened to him. And there's Butkus, named after another great middle linebacker to take a walk with. Ray does, however, keep busy. I'm involved in a newspaper, the Packer Report. I'm a spokesperson for a lot of companies. I've been very fortunate to take my, the fame that I, that I received playing football and, and try to incorporate it into my, into, my, into my life. Whether playing alone or in charity functions, Ray's competitive fire has now been transferred to the Lynx, his handicap three. And on occasion, he's had movie roles, as in The Longest Yard or endorsed Miller Lite Beer. Look like. But it is football that is still his passion, keeping up to date with today's stars, yet quick to offer his opinion on past greats. Without a question, the greatest running back was Jimmy Brown. Jimmy Brown was uh, uh, in a class all by himself. Just a terrific athlete, probably as good an athlete as I ever played against. The toughest quarterback I played against was Johnny Unitas. Uh, he was a player that you couldn't reach. He threw the ball well, and he saw good players. He was really a difficult quarterback to play against. The greatest moment, I think, that I experienced, though, was beating the Dallas Cowboys in the, in the coal of Lambeau Stadium. It was 50 below wind chill factor, and Bart Starr fell over for the touchdown. That had to be the highlight of my career. In 1978, Canton welcomed Ray Nitschke to the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and within Packer history, he's remembered as a leader of the defense that won five NFL championships and two Super Bowls. Oh, and I got my jersey here. That's pretty neat. What's your favorite team, Kevin? Oh, give me a break, man. <laughs> give me a break. Oh. And then there's his coach, whose memory he lives with each day. Lombardi was a perfectionist. He was never satisfied. Consequently, uh, I know myself as a ball player and as a human being as a, as right now in, in my life right now that I'm never satisfied. I can always do something a little better. He was tough on us like a father should be. Uh, he gave us good discipline. Uh, he trained us right. Uh, he prepared us for, uh, for, for later in life. Be the best you can. That motto drove a team of men to excellence. And on one of pro football's greatest teams, Ray Nitschke was one of their greatest players. The aerial 
little camera work you can see today comes to us from the airship Shamu, the high-flying ambassador for SeaWorld. But gentlemen, I want to get back to Ray Nitschke. Do you know what a thrill it was to be the quarterback in Super Bowl One? Look across the line of scrimmage and see this wild <laughs> man over there wanting to rip your head off. It was not a pretty sight. Hey, Lenny, how about today? If you ask him, Ray Nitschke's there chomping on a cigar, and he says, Ray, who is better, you or Dick Buckus? Uh -huh. And he would all of a sudden get a blank look on his face, and he'd look at you, Nick! How could you ask me a question like that? You know us better. <laughs> you know, the thing I remember about Ray Nitschke is the way that he used to rush the quarterback. I mean, I thought he was going to kill Burt Reynolds in the longest yard. I really did. <laughs> you know him as a great thespian. Before that, he was a great middle linebacker with the Packers. He's in the Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio, and he played in Super Bowls one and two. But you know, Lenny, a lot of things have changed since that first Super Bowl, including the price of a ticket. What was the price of the first ticket for your Super Bowl? Ten dollars. Ten dollars. Right now? These things are $150 oh, a piece. All right. And not only are they more expensive, but they are made a little bit different than they were back in your days. And we're going to see the way they're made in this week's pigskin potpourri. This year's Super Bowl ticket is special because it's a one-of-a-kind variety with a hologram in it. This three-dimensional image makes the ticket impossible to counterfeit. The process of making these tickets is fascinating. First Colorado model maker George Sivey made a microscopic sculpture, which included the Super Bowl trophy, the anniversary logo, and Tampa Stadium. There's only one of these sculptures around for security reasons. Next, a holographer in California added clouds and a special feature to the hologram. A twinkle in the fifth lace of the Lombardi Trophy football makes counterfeiting even more difficult. Then the ticket went to Polaroid in Massachusetts for printing. Only the exact number of Super Bowl tickets were made, so without the same hologram and manufacturer, you can be sure that no unwanted forger sneaks into the stadium. Gentlemen, this is the model that they use to make the hologram, that they use to make the Super Bowl tickets, and because it's one of a kind, no one can counterfeit a Super Bowl ticket. That's one of a kind, and yeah. you have it. Could you make me some tickets? Because folks are asking me for Super Bowl tickets. Absolutely no I problem. Need about I can a dozen. print up as many of these suckers as you want. Can you make some want. Super Bowl tickets with my picture on them? Absolutely <laughs> not. Those would never sell. <laughs> but <laughs> we'll throw them at $10 a piece for you. You're Ten bucks? Of mine, $10. He would charge me 20 at least. That's a <laughs> terrific deal. That's because that he did so well last week and for the playoffs. Last week, we were one-on-one. -on -one. We all thought San Francisco would be down here trying for a three-peat. And for the playoff series, Nick is still in That's front. That's right. All right for and I'm probably going to pick the teams you're going to pick so I can win the championship. Sitting on his lead, yeah. as always. Now, our guests have already made their selections to who they think is going to win Super Bowl 25. It is now our turn, and Nick, be my guest. I never thought I'd be saying this, but the Giants are the underdogs in this ball game. But they need a big game from Leonard Marshall, Eric Dorsey, Mark Collins and, La and Lawrence Taylor. If they can get that same type of pressure up the middle like they did against the 49ers, keeping Kelly in the pocket and get him up in his face and neutralize Thurman Thomas coming out of the backfield, then I think they have a chance to win the football game. The problem is the Bills are hitting on all eight cylinders. Their offense is just working real well. And that offensive line, Lenny, is as good as there is in the National Football League. And defensively, they can play ball. I like the Buffalo Bills. Oh, I knew it. Sitting on his lead. Absolutely. He's been picking oh, the Giants shit. all year long. That's right. And you don't have to pick the Bills. Guys. Pick the Giants. He picked the Bills beginning of the year. Let me tell you what's going to happen in this ball game. These two defenses are going to neutralize each other. Everybody talks about the New York Giants defense. Well, let me tell you something. The Buffalo Bills are every bit as good on the defensive side of the ball. So I really think this game comes down to Jim Kelly versus Jeff Hostetler. The passing game of the Buffalo Bills is much better. Uh, Andre Reed and James Lofton, who I think has been absolutely unbelievable this year, will make the difference. The Bills by at least 10. And also the special team play of the Buffalo Bills, although the Giants do an outstanding job. I think Buffalo is better in that department. I look at Buffalo like I looked at the 49ers last year. When they got to the playoffs, they got better with each ball game, and that's the way the Buffalo Bills are playing right now. They have the confidence necessary to win. And finally, the AFC will have a Super Bowl champion. Well, that's our show for this week from Tampa. We want to thank our guests for taking part in the show this week. We have one more show remaining, folks. This week, we close our show a little differently than usual. Everyone can show you highlights of Super Bowl 25 after the game is over, but we're going to show you highlights now before the game has been played. How are we going to do this? The folks from NFL Films, Masters of Football Magic, and yes, editing present inside the NFL's Super Bowl 25. Good afternoon and welcome to Tampa, Florida, where we're ready to celebrate the Super Bowl silver anniversary.
victory in the cold and Florida sunshine. We see the Buffalo faithful have taken their summer wardrobe out of mothballs. What style, what flair, but stop the presses. An Arctic air mass has somehow followed the Bills and Giants down from the north, and this could play meteorological mayhem with today's action. Really have snow. I don't care, whatever, <laughs> just soon play, whatever it is. Right. Don't play whatever kind of weather. The way this game is meant to be played outside. The conditions were mysterious, but the Bills quickly found some familiar terrain. Jim Kelly looking. He's throwing. He's got Andre Reid at the five. He's going to go in for the touchdown, and just like that, the Bills score first. Yes! Me, you, and Jim got to make the big play. You made first, all right? The Bills' hurry-up attack struck quickly, but the Giants' ultra-conservative offense ran out the last 28 and a half minutes of the first half. With number 76, Jumbo Elliott dominating Bruce Smith at the line, New York finally reached the end zone in the third quarter. He's trying to get outside around Bennett. He's going to get around him and turn the corner, and he picks up another first down. Hostetler hands it off now to O.J. Anderson. Anderson has a touchdown, and the Giants are on the board. The Giants missed the extra point, but the hero of the championship game, Matt Barr, kicked two fourth-quarter field goals to give New York a 12-7 lead with under three minutes to play. New York seemed to have a stranglehold on Super Bowl 25 and looked to pin the Bills deep in their own end. Kelly drops back the throw. Carl Banks is coming on a blitz. Kelly dumps it out for Thurman Thomas. It's intercepted. Oh, he dropped it. He dropped it. Jim Kelly floated up a little rainbow, but Lawrence Taylor dropped the pot of gold. The Bills were given a second life, but not long to live. So Jim Kelly reinstated the no-huddle offense, and the Bills hurried up down the field. Continue to go without a huddle. Jim Kelly looking to throw. Kelly looks for Lofton. James Lofton has it, but he fumbles the football. The New York Giants have it. Lawrence Taylor is coming downfield, and that ought to do it. The Giants are going to win the Super Bowl. But wait one minute. Marv Levy wants a replay, and it looks like he's going to get one. The official on the field will It seems the refs didn't spot the ball quickly enough for him. After all, we are talking hurry up offense, aren't we? We would have got it straight. The okay. difference is our quarterback has to hurry. He's okay. rushing. He's okay. fighting the clock. That's okay. it, isn't it? But I'm not the one that knows what the 25, 25 seconds But we'll see if the he Bills have lost their rhythm. There are eight seconds to go. Jim Kelly from the shotgun. He takes the snap. He's looking. The clock is ticking. Now he is throwing. He's got James Lofton open. He couldn't hold on to the football. The veteran could have been the hero. But there is still one tick left on the clock. One last chance for Buffalo to pull it out. They break the huddle. A whole season's worth of hopes and dreams hanging here in the balance of one second. The blink of an eye. Super Bowl 25. 